how then are pharmaceutical companies dealing with this problem of finding marketing people with this sort of long-run strategic perspective? Well, you know, those kind of people typically exist in companies. I mean, as you know, large companies typically have a, a, a pretty large cadre of talented marketing people. The challenge has been more getting them to see new, the, working on new products, which from the perspective of a marketer, I mean, you start, you get involved with a new product, recognizing it, it won't come to market probably for the next six or seven years. So how, how do you create an environment where you put enough rewards, enough prestige, uh, enough emphasis behind those kind of jobs, which are by their definition less less instant gratification than marketing a product where you you know you get a sales report every week and you get a p l every quarter uh, how, how do you change the it's the career environment within a company to make those jobs very attractive and and uh, something that I struggled with during my career was to try to make sure that the company was well supplied with people who were influencing the development of our coming products by putting almost almost tilting the playing field in favor of those new product marketing jobs. One of the things we've seen with respect to uh, new drugs from pharmaceutical companies is this sort of shift from most drugs coming out of the pharmaceutical company's own R&D organization to an increased uh, shift towards working with biotech companies and foreign pharmaceutical firms. How do you see this trend? Uh, you know, the, the licensing and cooperation and partnership in drugs, I think, has always been a part of the pharmaceutical scene, going back at least the length of my career. But it's taken on a, a much greater emphasis now and is likely to become even more important in the future. And the basic reason for that is simply a, a scarcity of, of good new product opportunities, good new product technology. Uh, in my view, if you were to assess all the products in development, whether they're in big companies or small companies, and then assess the stated growth goals of all the companies in the industry, the numbers just don't add up. There simply are not enough good new drugs to fuel everybody's growth needs. And that's created a, a fervor, a, an enormous pressure on companies to use both their internal development to make that more efficient and more pointed, but also to look outside the company and find ways of bringing good new product technology. And if you look at the, the value at which some relatively risky, relatively early stage new drugs trade when they are uh, switched or bought by one company or licensed to a, to a company, you get a sense of, of how uh, fervent I, I think that, that search is right now. M my own sense is that, I, I mean, there, the risks of in licensing versus the risks of internal development aren't all that different. Uh, drugs developed by small companies have no greater probability of being successful than ones developed by big companies, may, maybe even less so. But that companies, because of this need for new products to fuel their future, are going out there and doing a more aggressive job than ever to try to find these, uh, these new products anywhere they can. Many uh, pharmaceutical companies have very large sales forces. Um, on the one hand, they're very expensive, and on the other hand, there seems to be some pushback from the physicians. And then again, the internet is opening up all sorts of new communication devices or, or, or vehicles. Uh, how do you see the future of communications in the pharmaceutical industry? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question, and it's one that you know, I struggle with a lot during, the, especially the last several years of my, of my career at Wyeth. Uh, the number, of, I, I remember actually going back to 1990 when I think there were 14,000 or 15,000 sales representatives in the United States. I may have that number slightly wrong. And I remember people predicting what the 90s were going to look like uh, in a magazine uh, that published some uh, guru's thoughts about what the, the 1990s were going to look like. And I remember at that point, the, all the experts said, there are too many reps, uh, we don't need that many, the number is going to come down. I think between 1990 and uh, the year 2000, the number of reps quadrupled, <laughs> went up four times in the United States. And, and they went up on the basis of what I think now was kind of a, a faulty way of thinking, and that companies were applying like a television advertising model to their selling to physicians. They were looking at reach and frequency. 
how many doctors can we reach, how many times can we reach them. And gradually over the course of the 90s, what happened is it's not a TV commercial. You, d you don't turn it on and off. You don't ignore it very well. And it got to the point where there were so many sales reps calling on a relatively small number of doctors that we found that our customers were almost rebelling against this effort. We, we saw doctors' offices building defense mechanisms to keep reps from getting in to see the physician. And if you have any sense of what marketing might be in terms of serving customer needs, it, it got to the point of being almost uh, absurd. So uh, one of the things I, I did at Wyeth was frankly to say this doesn't make sense anymore. And Wyeth was the first company in the industry to drastically curtail and reform its sales operation in a way that uh, was much more respectful, I think, of what our customers wanted for us. I, I personally don't see the, the notion of personal selling, of having visits to doctor's office, offices going away. Uh, the representative, uh, if they're good, can do a great deal more than the internet can ever do and that they can establish a relationship. And also what representatives do is not only bring information, they also bring samples, patient aids, educational materials, and other things. And, and I do believe that creating that interpersonal relationship between the company through the sales representative with the customer is something that's worthwhile. But the quantity of, of personal selling, the number of reps, and their sensitivity to what customers want and need from them, I think, still has some room for improvement. How do you think uh, pharmaceutical companies will deal with the resistance that you're finding in uh, the physicians' offices? Well, companies did all kinds of things, you know, to try to get around the sales, I mean, get around the receptionist, you know. Uh, and all kinds of, you know, the, the salesmen had all kinds of little things that they could do to find a reason to get beyond the receptionist back into the doctor's office and then would, uh, in many cases, stand by the sample cabinet and wait for the doctor to walk by and then kind of, um, you know, see, see if they get a moment or two. But, but in the end, we, we felt, uh, and I felt strongly, that was becoming counterproductive to the point where our customers were beginning to resent us yeah. and resent the way we were dealing with them, and, and that could never be right.